So in previous lectures, we've talked about uh, the generalized Maxwell model. And in this lecture, we want to talk about the generalized Kelvin Voigt model. So uh, if you recall, the generalized Maxwell model used Maxwell elements all connected in parallel. And I guess the, the counterpart to that for the Kelvin Voigt model is Kelvin Voigt elements connected in series to make the generalized Kelvin Voigt model. So let's, let's uh, write that. So a generalized uh, Kelvin Voigt model, okay, and I'm gonna uh, write that as GKV for generalized Kelvin Voigt uh, model, uh, is a collection of Voigt, uh, Kelvin Voigt elements in series. So a collection of uh, Kelvin Voigt elements in series. Okay. And so what does that look like? So this is uh, straightforward to draw. We'll draw it kind of in the same way that we did before. There's our first Kelvin, Kelvin Voigt element. And it's going to be in series with another Kelvin Voigt element. Forgive my drawing. Okay, and I'm going to put a little slash here to say that this goes on, and then we have some other, the, the final, this would be like the n minus 1 element, and then we'd have finally our, our nth element here. Okay, so let's go ahead and label all the features uh, in this model. So this would be element 1, element 2, element n minus 1 and element n and we would label this as e1 e2 e n minus 1 and then e n and then this is obviously eta 1 eta 2 eta n minus 1 and eta n okay so that's the generalized kelvin voigt model all right, so let's make a couple observations just like we did with the Maxwell model. So here's our observations. Okay, observation uh, number one. What about the stress in this generalized model? Well, the stress in element one must be the stress in element two by virtue of them being connected in series. So the stress uh, is the same in all elements. Okay. So we can write that in equation that says that sigma, which is the stress in the whole, uh, the whole generalized model is equal to the stress in one, which is equal to the stress in two, which is equal to dot, 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 the stress in N minus one, which is equal to the stress in N. Okay. Let's go ahead and call that equation one. How about the, an observation on the strain? Well, the strains are going to sum. So the strain in the, generalized uh, Kelvin Voigt element uh, is the sum uh, of all the element strains. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that I have epsilon is equal to uh, epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 plus dot 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 plus epsilon n minus 1 plus epsilon sub n Call that equation two. So those are the observations that we can make relatively easily. And I want to just remind you of the governing equation for each element. Okay, so I'll just say recall, we already, we already derived this actually. Uh, the governing equation for each element. So the governing equation for each element is as follows, uh, is given by uh, sigma is equal to E times epsilon I plus eta times epsilon I dot. Let's call that equation three. Uh, maybe I should put a little I subscript on these, right? So since the stress is the same in all the elements, we don't need to subscript it, but the strains could be different. And of course the E and the eta could be different. So I don't imply like an Einstein summation when I write E I epsilon I, I'm just saying it's just, this is, I, the I is just identifying the element number. 
Okay, I'm not actually going to go through the entire solution process uh, uh, like I did for the Maxwell element, uh, mostly because that is your homework problem. But I'll, I'll just uh, remind you of the procedure. So I'll just say that via uh, similar procedures, okay, similar procedures uh, to the generalized Maxwell model, uh, we can develop the governing equation. Uh, differential equation. Okay, so I'll write that down for you in a second, but I want to remind you of the procedure. So in this case, uh, uh, step the first step A would be to take the Laplace transform uh, of three. Okay, step B would be to substitute uh, what we just computed in A uh, into the Laplace transform uh, of equation two. So taking the Laplace transform of three, uh, let me just say here, and then going ahead and solving uh, for uh, epsilon bar, okay? Or sorry, yeah, epsilon i bar. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the step one. Step two is substituting that back into the equations. Uh, then what do we do? Well, then, just like we did before, we're going to reduce uh, to a polynomial in Laplace transform space. Uh, polynomials, uh, right, in Laplace transform space. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and take the inverse Laplace transform to get the solution in the time domain. Okay, that's the steps. So take the inverse... Laplace transform uh, to get the solution uh, in the time domain. Okay, again, that's a homework set so, uh, problem, so I'm not going to solve it exactly, but I'll give you the strategy that you need to use. When you do all that, you end up with the governing equation that looks like this. So the governing equation uh, is going to be given by the sum, very much like we had for our Maxwell generalized model, sum from i equals 0 to n um, of q i uh, partial i, partial, uh, the ith derivative of epsilon with respect to time uh, is going to be equal to now uh, sum from i equals 0 now to n minus 1 uh, p sub i, the ith derivative of sigma with respect to time. Okay, let's call that equation four. Let me give you some remarks on, on this model, on the Kelvin Voigt, the generalized Kelvin Voigt model. So just like I did before uh, for the Maxwell model. So here's some remarks. Number one is that the generalized Kelvin Voigt model is more convenient to use uh, when you have a stress history. Okay to use uh, with a stress history, right? And we talked that the strain history, if we had a strain history, the generalized Maxwell model was, was easier to use. And remark number two is that uh, to represent in this model a pure spring or a pure dash pot. So to represent a, uh, so if we have a pure spring, then we're going to go ahead and say that the element, the the viscosity eta of that element is going to go to zero. If you want to represent a pure dash pot, uh, then we would take the spring and set it equal to zero. Okay. So if the, if you wanted to do that, that that's how you'd uh, do that. Okay. I want to compare the governing differential equations for the model. So I'll just say recall uh, the governing uh, differential equation, right, uh, for the generalized Maxwell model. Okay, and and that looked like the sum of from i equals zero to n of p sub i, the ith derivative of sigma, with respect to time, would be equal to the integral. Or sorry, the sum. Of, from i equals 1 to n of 
uh, Q sub i, the ith derivative with respect to, of epsilon with respect to time. Okay, that was what we had. So here, let me make an observation. They have the same form. Look at this equation and look at equation four. So the the generalized Kelvin Voigt and the generalized Maxwell models have the same form. And what is that form? Okay, that, that form is that I could write the sum from i equals zero to n of, let's say, p i, the ith derivative of sigma with respect to t, right, is equal to i equals zero to n of q i, the ith derivative of epsilon with respect to t. Let's call that equation five. Okay, so this is the general form for both models. In fact, this is the general form for a generalized viscoelastic model, right? We can recover the generalized Maxwell model. How do we do that? Well, by just setting Q naught equal to zero. And we can recover the generalized Kelvin model or Kelvin Voigt model by setting P sub N equal to zero, right? So those are, this is the, the generalized form of, of uh, a material exhibiting viscoelastic behavior, a model that would describe that. I want to give you a little bit uh, uh, further uh, some definitions and just say that equation five, uh, it, it can be written in a more compact form. So can be written more compactly using what are called differential operators. Okay, it can be written more compactly uh, using uh, what are called differential operators. So what we want to do is we want to define the first dif differential operator, well, P, we'll call it, is going to be equal to uh, P0 plus uh, P1 partial with respect to T plus dot, 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 plus Pn partial N with respect to T. Okay, and we're going to define a uh, differential operator, we'll call it Q, as Q0 uh, plus Q1 partial with respect to T plus dot 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 uh, Qn partial the nth derivative with respect to T. Okay, and we could write these as sums if you'd like. Uh, we could write these sums from i equals zero to n of P sub i partial with respect to i sorry, partial, the i-th derivative with respect to t. And similarly, we can write this with q sub i, the i-th derivative with respect to t. Okay? So we, we can write those in that, in that form. And then just note that when we've written them in this form, we can say where uh, p and q uh, have a... Uh, 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 polynomial Laplace transforms. Okay, that's a key feature, right? So that if we were to do a Laplace transform of P, call it P bar, that's gonna look like, uh, right? P naught plus P one S plus dot, 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 plus P N s to the n, and similarly, q bar is going to be equal to uh, uh, q naught plus q1 s plus dot 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 plus q n s to the n, right? Those are polynomial terms. And so what does that mean? That means that uh, the description, this is kind of the key point here. So the description uh, for viscoelastic uh, behavior of any material so the description of viscoelastic behavior uh, of any material, okay, uh, can be represented as follows. So it uh, can be represented as uh, 
P times sigma is equal to Q times epsilon, right? Those are differential operators operating on sigma and epsilon. Or in Laplace transform space, it's P bar times sigma bar is equal to Q bar times epsilon bar. Okay, so the description of viscoelastic behavior of any material can be represented in this way. Um, so it's just a matter of how many elements do you want? How easy is it going to be to try to, to fit these parameters? And you can imagine uh, we're going to probably choose an approximation, right? So a real material may have a whole spectrum, and we're going to try to represent that spectrum maybe with, with three element types or something. And there's a lot of journal papers that are written on how to do that, the best way to do that, the most efficient way to do that, those kinds of things. But this is the, the sort of the foundation of all of that. Okay?